All right, let's just turn back one more page from where we last were to hymn number 108. <clears throat> Is there a heart or bound by sorrow? Is there a light weighed down by care? Come to the cross, each burden bearing, all your anxiety, all is there. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the Well, are we awake? <laughs> uh, well, those testimonies should have got us awake a little bit, hearing from other people uh, what the Lord's doing in their lives and influencing us in so many ways. Uh, small numbers, but a great encouragement for me to be here with everybody, and I hope it's the same for each one of you, that we love to gather with each other and that the Lord works through us to reach the lost people of Pal. And I know we're all working on people. We are. We just got to keep praying, don't we? God would get them, bring them right here to be right with us, to experience the things that we're experiencing. So great. They are so great. Um, we are... In 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, we've covered uh, many things, but we're going to finish going over some of the definitions of some of the gifts. And I know that I have went into these at a time before, but uh, we're hitting them again because it's appropriate for where we're at in chapters 12, 13, and 14. And if you notice, I didn't teach this section how we normally do, where I take a couple pieces out of each one. But I try to take a lot of the whole of it to give us a little bit of an understanding of 
specifically spiritual gifts. And we know that that's what Paul deals with in 12, 13, and 14 are the question that the Corinthians had about what about spiritual gifts, Paul. You got to help us out here. And that's exactly what Paul is doing with them. And I believe rightly dividing the Word of God in reference to spiritual gifts. We aren't in our day rightly dividing the Word of God in reference to the gifts of the Spirit and we're being led astray in so many areas. And currently what we're looking at is the two time elements of the spiritual gifts. They're broken down into two areas, the sign gifts or temporary gifts and those stationary or permanent gifts. We've already covered all the sign gifts. Who knows how many sign gifts there are? Taryn said seven, and that's exactly right. There are seven uh, sign gifts. And I'll tell you what they are again. They are apostleship, prophecy, miracles, healing, knowledge, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. And what we mean by sign gifts, again, or temporary gifts, is that they were useful to the church when the church began. But by 100 A.D., after the church had begun, and we had the full canon of Scripture, those gifts that were given with those specific purposes that God had for them had ceased or were done away with. And we already know apostleship. There's not any more apostles, is there? With the gift of apostleship. Or those with the ability of prophecy to see the future events and record those events. You know, the big name for Bible prophecy is, does anybody know what it is? What is it? No, uh, Sandy said in the back, it's eschatology. Kind of a big term for looking into the few prophecy, Bible prophecy, eschatology. So that gift is no longer available to be able to see into the future and record those events that are there. They've already happened. We have the Bible. And then miracles. We know that the miracles, the supernatural ability that people were given to do those miracles has ceased. They don't have the power to do it, but that doesn't say that there's no miracles, right? God's still a God working miracles, just not giving the power to any individual person. That's the same with healing. God heals, but not the power for any one of us to heal like they did in the beginning of the church age. And then we know knowledge, that knowledge being able to receive revelation from God and record it by inspiration on paper too. That gift is no longer amongst us in tongues. Not actually gibberish speaking or a prayer language, but actually a language given. And we have to understand, remember it was for the purpose, for the purpose of sharing God's Word. So when they had, were given a tongue, they spoke God's Word that wasn't written down yet, but the Holy Spirit gave them the power and the ability to do that so they could hear about many great truths. But once we had the completion, there was no longer a need for the gift. There's all kinds of, all kinds of things written out there in reference to tongues. And another thing I want to just remind you of again that really hit me last week when we were going through it was, you know that it's for unbelievers. But yet we saw that passage where it almost looked like it contradicted our, itself and said that, well, if those come into the church that, that don't know, I mean, it almost sounds like it was for them and they could hear the Word of God. But I want you to see that I think the gift of tongues was generally used not within the church walls. We know that prophecy, the teaching, the preaching of the Word was God's method, but we would see that beyond the church sharing with other people that you didn't have the ability through, through the language that God gave the Word of God to share with those people. So I think the real application, the real biblical application was actually beyond the church walls, not within the church corporate setting. And that's what, that's what Corinth was doing. And they had the prayer language and all those things. But Paul was giving a correction to them in trying to speak truly what the tongues was for. And then we looked at the interpretation of tongues, didn't we? So when it went out and they went beyond and they were able to speak that tongue to somebody else, 
The interpreter was there so that the interpreter then was given that word too so that he could bring that back to the speaker so he, there could be a full understanding of what was spoken through it. And I can tell you, I've witnessed it. I've been around the tongues. I've been around, and it, there's not ever an operation like that that I've seen. I've never seen it working in a way that would even be a biblical way, but always outside. But I'm here to say that we know in verse 13, just to read that again, it says in verse 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. That means they'll be done away with. The gift of prophecy... Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Speaking of the tongues there. And then he goes on, uh, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away too. Those were the sign gifts, many of those sign gifts that we looked at. And I hope we're getting an understanding of those things so that we wouldn't be led astray or that somebody else that's led in a way that's not in the right pattern, we can put them back on the right path. Now we're going to move into those gifts that are the stationary gifts, the permanent gifts. That means these gifts were given for all the church age. So these are active and these are valid today where the other ones have gone away. And we know, Taryn, how many of the permanent gifts are there? Eleven? Did you say eleven? Eleven. Eleven of the permanent, seven of those that are done away with. The first one we're going to look at is the gift of wisdom. Wisdom. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit. We know the knowledge that it's speaking of here. That's one of those that's done away. But then there's wisdom that's here. What is wisdom? This is, I'll give you a definition of it, this is a supernatural ability to rightfully understand, to apply and spiritually employ the information gained in the Word of God. Wisdom. That's kind of a long one, isn't it? I'll read it again. I'll read what I have written down here. This is a supernatural ability to rightfully understand, apply and spiritually employ the information gained from the Word of God. That's wisdom. Now as we go through this, I want you guys evaluating your lives too. Some of you already know what your gifts are, but if you don't know, God wants to use this to show you what your gift is so you can use it in the local body that we grow together through it. Because I need your gift. Because I don't have all the gifts, and you don't have all the gifts, and we need one another. So knowledge here. I think of Solomon in the Old Testament, wisest man, the Queen of Sheba came to listen to all his wisdom, wrote many of the Proverbs, didn't he? But yet he even wrote one book, I think it was Ecclesiastes, where he sees everything is vanity, doesn't he? All is vanity. Carol, like I know Carol went through that. All is vanity. All is meaningless out there. He was able to see all but the Lord was meaningless. So he had wisdom. But you know, the New Testament says there's a greater than Solomon. A greater than Solomon is here. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is wisdom, isn't he? Wisdom. And as we look at him and in all that he is, we can see wisdom and come to an understanding of wisdom. But though, you know those people that have the supernatural ability? You've been around those people that have this wisdom, that you can see this gift here where they can take God's Word and they can understand it, they can apply it, and they can spiritually employ the information that they've gained from it. Have you seen that? There are people that have that supernatural gift. And it may, it may be one that they have that gift over, the li over life circumstances. Whether they're talking about marriage, whether they're talking about raising children, whether they're talking about em employment, friendships that you have. We could go on and on about the things, and it seems like you can go to them with the questions to life, and they have that supernatural ability 
to answer from God's Word. And it's like, where, how did you get that? How, how did you come up with that? That's great. That's a great understanding. They can take it and you can understand it. That's wisdom. Supernatural power of wisdom. We know that we're all supposed to, I think we're all, I guess I would say we're all wise. I mean, in so, some manner or not, but not necessarily having the gift of wisdom. I, I don't like it when people say that others are stupid or you don't know anything because God has created all of us with special things about each one of us. Even somebody that is handicapped mentally is special and they know great things and there's some wisdom with, with those folks too. But not this wisdom that we're speaking of here, supernatural, supernatural wisdom given from God to people. And then we have the second one is the gift of discerning spirits. I still believe there's a few here that have that gift. Right here. In the room with us right now, I think they have this gift. And it's this. I'll give you the definition for the, the gift of discerning spirits. 1 Corinthians 12.10. First, let me read it, though. It says, another, the, uh, another, to, the, to another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. We know in that passage right there, all are gone except the discerning of spirits. That's the only one that's left in stationary. But this is the definition. The supernatural ability to distinguish between demonic, human, and divine works in another person. Whether they be demonic, humanistic, or divine in another person. Being able to have that unique ability to analyze these people, it seems like, oftentimes have that first impression of somebody that they're around, and God gives them supernaturally an ability to see something in them that people that don't have this gift can't see. We've been, we've been around the people. And there's two spots of this. There's two areas of discerning of spirits. One is general and then one has to do more with people. So general, I'll give you an example of the general. These, both of these all look and evaluate the motives, whether good or evil, true or false, in the circumstances. So somebody that has the general discerning of spirits, this is a person that can see the sign of the times. You know people like that? I hear, hear preach, preachers like that all the time, that they know the sign of the time. They can see it a little bit better out there, and they can preach on it where we are currently. Have you seen that? I've seen that. Or those people that have that supernatural ability just to know things that are happening around them, what's going on around them. Is this good, evil, true, or not true? Do I need to be careful with this, discerning? I'm going to talk about a couple movements here. People here with this gift can see some of these movements that come through the church. That's why I like, really like this gift, because I want to rely on those people here that have it, because they're going to help me recognize something that's false that's coming our way that I might not have picked up on yet. I don't think I have the, I don't have the gift of discerning spirits like this, so being able to rely on those around us that have it and to listen and see, it might be the ecumenical movement. I spoke on that before, but these people can see the ecumenical movement. I think they see it before they've even put a label on it. You know, they, they labelize things, but they've, they've, they know it's there before we put the label. Remember the ecumenical movement, still current, I think, is that where we want to lay aside our doctrine. We want to lay aside the truth of God's Word so that we can come together with all other Christians in unity. And I don't know about you that... But that means then you have to sacrifice some things. You have to sacrifice some truth. Well, this is out there going on. And somebody with the gift of discerning spirits, general, they're going to be able to pick up on it just like that. Uh-uh. No way. There's something up with that. You're telling us we have to sacrifice truth. Really, to become together to become one in that. And there's some things that we can't do. And this is the new one. 
We've been under this um, in churches just here recently. I think it is probably the biggest movement going on currently, I believe, within the church walls, and it's called the emergent church. The emergent church. If you don't know what it is, you ought to study it and see what it is because it's sweeping everywhere in America, the nation. And as you look at it on the surface, it looks like it could be good. But as you have those people with the gift of discerning spirits around you, they begin to show you what the truth is behind it. And it's a bad thing. What it wants to do. I want to just kind of summarize a big picture of what it is. There's a lot of, a lot of other things that are, that are with it, but it wants to take... There's, it's the big church movements. That's really, it surrounds the big mega church, big church movements of, of people. And so as you look at it, man, we want what they got because look at the growth in that church. Look at all the people that are going to that church and that they're reaching... And, and we're kind of, I want a little bit of what that is because our church isn't growing like those churches are growing. So on the surface, you begin to look at it, you, well, maybe there's something good that's there. But you know what they're doing, the, what's behind it is they want to make the church appealing to the world. If we can make the church appealing to the world, Guess who we can get inside the church walls? The world. So if we make it appealing, we can get the world inside the church. But what does the Bible call us to? Separation. We're different from the world. We're not the same as the world. When people come in here, we don't want them to see the world. We want to see them Jesus Christ and Him crucified, don't we? The Word of God. We don't sing the songs that the world's singing. Why? Because of that. It's different. We want to be a holy and reverent and lift up the Lord. But you have to know it if you don't. There is a great big movement out there, and there are many people that are moving in it, into it, and you're seeing a great mass of people. But now I want you, if you see those people, I want you to take many of those individual people and you go and talk with them. See if there's growth in their life. There's growth within the walls of the church because it's the world. Who wouldn't, tell me, who wouldn't from the world want to come into a worldly church? There's no reason not to come, is there? But if, there's, if you preach the Word of God and the truth of the Word of God and the Word of God is convicting on the heart, do people want to be there? Was anybody convicted this morning? on praying. I was. I was. Myself. People don't want to hear that where we're convicted of different areas in our life. The emergent church. Those people, general, discerning of spirits, they're going to pick up on it. They're going to see it. It happened to us, a church that we were going in before. It was coming in and it looked good. But there was people around, Brother Dick, Sandy, and they were saying, time out, wait a minute, I can see what this is. You guys just can't see it yet. And that's how it happened. Then people were able to begin to see what was, what was going on. Discernment, right? I'm going to share a story I think I have before about Brother Dick. I think it was just spot true to church that we were going to before we were going to bring in a youth pastor. And this youth pastor wasn't married. And Brother Dick said, you know, there are some cautions with bringing this man in. First of all, he always comes with the Word of God. And he says, you know, I think really for pastors, it shows, I got my hymnal, but I'm representing it to be the Bible. <laughs> he, he says, you know, really qualifications for a, a pastor, it looks like in the Bible, those qualifications, they ought to be married. And I kind of went to task with him a little bit, thinking, you know, Paul wasn't married. I, yeah, Peter, Peter was married. So, does a pastor have to be married for sure or not? Brother Dick knows a pastor that they had that when his wife died, he, 
he got out of the pulpit because he didn't feel he could be in that position without, without his wife. Wherever you are on the issue, I, I want you to see this with it, though. The heart of this was what Brother Dick could see, is we've got a man here that's not married. And he's going to be working with the youth. Is there going to be a greater opportunity for him to fall into sin than a man that we would bring to work with the youth that had a wife by his side? What? Yeah. That was kind of a premise behind the wisdom and the things that I could see that he was saying. You, you, you know, I don't know if everybody knows it, but I think there was some falling that happened there. This youth pastor that came in fell in that area. Exactly, and I don't even know if Brother Dick knows that or not, that that happened, but the discernment was able to see something ahead that was going to happen. I think. I think we have to rely on those that have a discerning spirit amongst us because they're going to keep us from moving in an area that we ought not to move in. In our... God has put those people in this church. And I want to, you know, if, if you have to shake me up a little bit to get a hold of me, I want you to do that when you got that gift. You need to see this. You need to understand it. Because I want to listen. And I can get going in a direction. And I can be kind of stubborn too going. But I want to be awakened by those that have a discerning spirit when I need to be. Because it's going to keep us and the church together out of error and going in ways that we ought not. And I think the story that I told, you can see it rippled many times over in many other areas of people's lives. The same things. We move on from the gift of discerning spirits. I'll, just people real quick. I'll just hit on that. It's the same thing, but just with people. People that, ha that you have a discerning spirit. Somebody could come in within the walls here and one with a discerning spirit is going to pick up on something to be cautious about where somebody else may be naive and not be able to see it. We've got to listen. We've got to listen what God has. And then there's the gift of giving. Romans 12, 8. I'm going to hustle. I know I'm losing. I'm losing everybody. I know we're getting... That food's really settling in. It is. It is with me too. Romans 12, 8. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. We have the gift of giving. Some people have the supernatural ability to give. And it, the definition is supernatural ability to accumulate and give large amounts of one's finances to the glory of God. So it can be somebody that can accumulate a great amount of money and give to the church. But I also want you to look at this. It can be somebody that doesn't have a lot. Remember the widow? In the widow's might? There were people there that had an abundance of wealth. Riches. And they gave out of their riches, didn't they? To God. But then there's, here's this old widow with just a mite, which was the smallest amount of money. Probably like a penny to us. She gives it, and it's all she had. It was all her living. She had, the, she had the gift of giving. Even though she didn't have anything, she gave what she did have to other people. But there's other people that, that have the gift, and they may be here in the church, and that the Lord says, you need to give this amount of money. And it might be a significant amount that you wouldn't think, why would the Lord want me to give that? I want that for myself, Right? No, supernatural ability to give to the Lord's work. Giving. Aren't you thankful for those people that God has given that special gift of giving? We're all to give, aren't we? We're all to tithe unto the church, to give our gifts, our things to the church. But these people have a supernatural ability and they go over and beyond for the Lord in their giving. What a great thing it is. And, and blessings that they bring upon the church and other people for that gift that they have. Thank the Lord for it. There are three local churches. I'm not going to go into them just for sake of time, but I'll, I'll, the church in Jerusalem in Acts 4 had that unique ability 
Galatian church did, the Philippian church also gave in the same manner. Kind of hit me just with our church as I was going over this again that God's given us a, even though we're a small church, where we can give out of the abundance of what God has blessed us with to another church. Not only we're supporting a missionary, but, but if we can, like what I was talking with everybody about, if we can give an additional gift to the work in England there that the Lord has given us to help them. Doesn't the Lord want us to do that? He's blessed us. Let us bless others that are doing the Lord's work and make them more efficient in the things that they're doing for the service of the Lord. So we can enter into that as a church, but we can also enter into that individually in our lives, the gift of giving. And then exhortation, 12.8, same spot, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. And I think we got an exhorter amongst us. That's Shannon. I think that she's got that supernatural ability to exhort and come alongside. Um, let me give you the definition. The supernatural ability to deliver challenging words. Supernatural ability to deliver challenging words. Now with this also, there are usually people that can come alongside and give good advice to other people. They can also give great counsel. We see them being counseling where they can come alongside and counsel you. But it's always for this purpose to excite the hearts of the people that they're talking with, right? I, I see that with Shed. She wants to come alongside the people and excite their heart and build them up and get them going in the right direction, doesn't she? she that's what she wants. To, did you hear a little bit? Of, I could see a little bit of the gift this morning when she shared testimony. She's working with a couple of these gals, trying to excite them and come alongside them, give them advice and counsel them to a closer relationship with the Lord. And the one, she's trying to encourage her to bring her back to work with the other one that's close to her. Isn't that it? That's a gift. I'm, I'm glad for that. I saw her sitting in here with uh, Renee last week after everybody else had cleared and there she is. And you know, I was going to come in here and see if I could sit and talk with Renee. And I thought, you know, Shannon's there and she's got the gift for encouragement. She's better off being there than I am. So that was a great thing, how the Lord gives us those gifts together. And there are many, too, here that I could share with from the Bible. Barnabas, Judas, and Silas, and Jude had the great, unique ability to be exhorters and to come alongside people and do the same thing. Is that your gift? Do you have the gift of exhort? I'm not an exhorter. I have, to, I have to work to come alongside and kind of encourage people like that. I have to make yourself do it a little bit more than somebody that's just got that gift that just does it. Just does it. And then the last one for today anyway, we'll look at some more next week, is the gift of ministering. We also see it as ministering, but there are a couple other words that you'll see in the Bible. I think that might be Taryn. You see Taryn was kind of winking at me over there. I think that's Taryn's gift, ministering, or helps, or servant. Kind of all lumped in that same thing with ministering. Not ministering thinking that you're, if you want to say you're somebody that's a full-time minister in the way that you're maybe a preacher or something like that, or an evangelist, but just ministering, helping and being a servant. I think Shelly's got, that's, that's Shelly's gift a little bit more on that side too. Is She's not the one to come and plan what's going to happen. But if you plan it and you want to do it, then she'll come alongside and she'll assist you and she'll help you. So the gift of ministering or help service is the supernatural ability to render practical help, practical help, in both the physical and the spiritual realm. So the physical and the spiritual. You all know those people that are servants. Have you there to do what they can at the church at any point in time? Maybe you don't even have to ask them. They come and they do different things. They'll go out and help other people that need help out there. I think uh, we don't get to be around him a, a, whole, a whole bunch, but, uh, and I don't even know if, 
if he knows this or not, but Paul Sapp, I think, has got the ability. He's got a gift of ministering. You see, when we needed him here to help us for our Valentine's banquet, he pulled up here at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, ready to go to help cook the prime rib. Do you know what? When he got here, somebody else was supposed to meet him. <laughs> somebody, somebody else was supposed to meet him here at 1 o'clock, but Lee was having back problems, so he had taken a muscle relaxer, and he missed his time getting here, but Paul was here. You can see he was ready to help and minister, and he actually has to be careful with it, I think, with his wife and within his home, because I think the whole ex, all the extra time he has, he would be about helping other people. And his wife says, there's got to be some time for me and the kids. So he's got to kind of balance it, even though he's got that gift. I think I see it with him. He would do anything out there. I could ask him at any point in time, and there wouldn't be a doubt in my mind that he would come and that he would do whatever he needed to do. That supernatural ability. See, there's some people that don't have it, where it's like, ah, mm, no. I've got too many other things that I'm going to do over here, or this or that. You don't have the gift of ministering or serving like that or, or helping other people out. You just don't, and that's all right if you don't have it because there's other people that have it. Although God wants us that sometimes we've got to, Shelly says this, even though I think she has a gift here a little bit, there's areas that she sees that she's not as good at in serving in those areas. But then she's challenged when she has to take up the rope and do it. So there's times that we do have to serve even though we don't have the gift, right? We have to come alongside and we have to do those things because God wants us to put other people before ourselves. That's a good thing. But this is a supernatural ability. And Paul Sapp is happy. When he does it, when I came over here and visited with him and Lee out here, he, he was happy the whole time. I, I don't think I, I, Lee was with him a little bit longer, but I didn't ever see him where he wasn't happy. He was serving the Lord, and it made him happy. It was good, good thing. So do you have one of these gifts that we've covered here? Do you have that supernatural wisdom? Do you have a supernatural ability to discern spirits? To be able to give of what God has blessed you with? Supernatural ability of exhorting other people, exhortation, encouraging, or maybe it's ministering. Whatever it is, you know the Lord wants us to find what the gift is that we have. And I'm going to end reading a couple of scriptures that I had, I've read before. From 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Neglect not. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. So there was a gift that Timothy had that had been given, and he was told not to neglect it. You see, we mentioned before, each of you at the time of salvation was given a gift. God's telling us, don't neglect the gift that I've given you. And then over in 1 Timothy 1.6 Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Timothy had a gift. Paul didn't want him to let it lay dormant. But he needed to stir it up. If you want to say, you know, that fire, I think of a fire, you know, if we want to really get a fire going, we got to get a little oxygen to it, don't we? In those places, what are those things called? That, yeah. Billow? Like B-I-L-L-O-W? Billow. You want to just fan it. You want to get it perking up and going. And that's what we want to do with looking at the gifts here. And that's, I think, what Paul wanted to do at the church in Corinth. He wanted to expose them to the air of the doctrine of the gifts of the spirit that they were in, and he, he wanted to show them the truth, but then he wanted them to find their gift and fan it, into, fan it into flame. Get it going. Get it working and operating in your life and in my life. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. 
And you will have joy. Brother Kurt said that to me. When we were going over to Grace Baptist Church, I remember talking with Brother Kurt in the morning, and he said that, yep, brother, when you get in that area that the Lord has you, where your gift is, you're going you're gonna to have a joy that you can't have in any other place. When you use your gift, there's a joy that you have that is inexplicable. You can't explain it. It's really hard to explain it. It's great, though, what the Lord has in it. Let's end. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for our study that you've been taking us through here. Lord, as we've been looking at the gifts of the Spirit, Lord, I, I want to be able to, Father, as we're looking at this, to be able to rightly divide the Word of God. Lord, help us, help my brothers and sisters here to be able to see and understand those permanent gifts, Lord, the stationary gifts that we have here, that they're available for us today right now. And, but Lord, help each one of us to understand and, and know what's happened to those sign gifts, the temporary gifts, and understand why you gave them at the time, what the purpose was behind them, Lord. We thank you for them, we do, and for the work that they've done. But I thank you for this morning, like Sandy said, that we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have the completed word of God, and we know that those sign gifts ended when we had the complete word. Thank you, Lord, for it. Thank you for your word this morning. Help us to take, Lord, what we've learned from these gifts here tonight, the permanent gifts that are still available. Lord, help us to evaluate our lives in reference to them. Lord, have you given us that gift? If you have. If you have, Lord, I know that there's some here that specifically can say, I'm, I am that minister, I have helps. God wants you to do it to his glory. Those exhorters, God wants you to do it for his glory. Those that have discernment, God wants you to do it for his glory. And to see and experience the joy that he's going to give you in those areas. Father, I thank you for every one that you've given us in our church. Lord, I pray that you bring others too, but the ones that you've given us, Lord, the gifts that they have, how you give them to each one to balance us, Lord. We, we need one another. We can't do it alone, Lord, and I just thank you. Help me to be willing to always listen, Lord, to those that are out there, Lord, that, that are here that have the gifts, Lord, that I don't have. Help me to lean on them, Lord. That's just what you want us to do. And thank you for each one. I thank you for you, Lord, because when you ascended, when you died, you rose again and you ascended up into the heavenly realms. You told us and promised us that you would give us gifts. And that's what we're looking at. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.